Greetings, dear members of the Committee on Legislation, Mandates, Regulation and Supervision of the agency. Greetings, dear members of the Committee on Legislation, Mandates, Regulation and Supervision of the agency. Greetings, dear members of the Committee on Legislation, Mandates, Regulation and Supervision of the agency. Greetings, dear members of the Committee on Legislation, Mandates, Regulation and Supervision. Can I just say something? I'm, I'm getting the same. I'm getting the same translation of the same welcome message from the from the chair. Yes, we have some technical problems. Thanks to members of the committee on legislation, mandates, regulation, and supervision. Can I just say something? I'm, I'm getting the same. I'm getting the same translation of the same welcome message from the from the chair. Yes, we have some technical problems. Thanks to members of the Committee on Legislation, Mandates, Regulation and Supervision. Can I just say something? I'm, I'm getting the same. I'm getting the same translation of the same welcome message from the from the chair. Yes, we have some technical questions. Thanks to members of the Committee on Legislation, Mandates, Regulation and Supervision. Same, I'm getting the same translation of the same welcome message from the from the chair. Yes, yeah, so we have some technical questions. Thank you. We apologize to Mr. Simons and the participants for the technical difficulties uh, we were having in broadcasting. Um, so, as I was saying, welcome to this joint meeting of the members of the Committee on Legislation, Mandates, Immunities, and Rules of Procedure of the Assembly and Oversight of the Anti-Carrier Option Agency. Uh, with uh, uh, former president of the Assembly of the Election uh, of Judges, Mr. Malcolm Simons. This is upon request of Mr. Simons addressed to the Assembly to be heard by the MPs concerning his points of view on the uh, EU Lex mission in Kosovo, the EU European Union rule of mission, a rule of law mission in Kosovo. So this request was formalized uh, through a request of six MPs of different parliamentary groups addressed to the uh, uh, Committee on Legislation in order to have a such a meeting convened. So the Committee on Legislation had addressed the presidency of the Assembly and the presidency of the Assembly through the claim 08010 uh, had concluded that the committee should act according to the applicable legislation according to the rules of procedures of the Assembly. So allow me to first of all to make certain conclusions, general conclusions and uh, certain remarks uh, then, then I will inform you certain, regarding certain technical technicalities. First of all, uh, the ULEX mission in Kosovo 
is uh, defined through the international agreement and ratified in the Assembly of the, the Assembly of the Republic of Kosovo through the law 0550 L102, part of which is the agreement between the Republic of Kosovo in this case and the European Union. Secondly, Mr. Simons currently is not part of the ULEX mission and today he's not speaking in capacity of a member of this mission, but as a former of uh, Assembly of Judges, of ULEX Judges in Kosovo. And thirdly, upon the most recent decision of the Euro European Union, the ULEX mission, it shall be extended until 14th of June of 2023. So I'd like to thank you very much. As a committee on legislation, we have taken a decision, we have issued a decision to invite Mr. Simons to present his view angles before the members of the committee on legislation and before um, MPs concerned of the Assembly of the Republic of Kosovo. Uh, so due to efficiency reasons, we have decided to invite or to enable each uh, group three to five minutes or three to five MPs to participate in this meeting, except for other members on the committee on legislation. So the Committee on Legislation has considered this meeting as joint meeting in an effort to start at 10 o'clock and end at 1300 hours. So first of all, we, we have considered that Mr. Simons will have uh, 30 minutes time, approximately 30 minutes time to present his view angles, general points of views, a view. Uh, meanwhile, the president and peace, not only the members of the Committee on Legislation, but each MP is, MP is free to ask questions, always adhering to the a limited limited time of five minutes. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to share any information for the public. So uh, we have not, because of the, we, we did not want to overload, uh, overburden this meeting with more members. So the meeting is being broadcast in YouTube channel of the assembly, except for the RTK, uh, TV broadcasting it live. So, Mr. Simons, I uh, would like to hand over to floor, the floor to you. So, please respect the 30 minutes time to to present your points of view before the members of the Assembly of the Assembly of the Republic of Kosovo. Thank you very much. Fine. Thank you very much. I will do my best to stick within the uh, the time limit. Um, so, thank you first of all for inviting me um, to address you this morning. Um, some of the information that I want to share with you relates to ongoing criminal investigations and matters that are currently before the courts. In respect of those matters, at this stage, I cannot provide you with specific detail. I know that you will understand the reasons why. However, in due course, um, should the committee decide to open a full inquiry, I will provide you with full details and documentary and other evidence in support of what I am going to tell you this morning. Um, in addition, I want to tell you that I have been reminded by the UK Foreign and Commonwealth Office that I remain subject to the UK Official Secrets Act, which prevents me disclosing certain um, quite sensitive information. Um, were I to reveal that information, I could be prosecuted in the UK. Having said that, should you decide to open a full inquiry, I'm confident the UK government would wish to assist your inquiry and will waive whatever legal obligations it believes that I am subject to. Um, your decision to consider the possibility of an inquiry is nevertheless an important first step in improving the administration of justice in Kosovo. Um, indeed, it has become clear over the past few months that this is what the people of Kosovo um, wish to see. I will endeavour to provide you with as much detail as I'm permitted to at this stage and to answer any questions that you have. Um, I also want to tell you that I am not alone. Other former staff members of ULEX have indicated their willingness um, to speak with you as part of a, a full inquiry. So in 2008, I was seconded by the UK government to the um, EU planning team in Kosovo, which became ULEX. Um, in 2014, I was appointed president of ULEX judges 
um, and a judge of the Kosovo Supreme Court. I left ULEX in 2017 following victimization by senior staff of the European External Action Service in Brussels. Since 2013, I have reported to the UK Foreign and Commonwealth Office instances of serious misconduct of ULEX staff, including the commission of criminal offences and interference by ULEX senior management in criminal trials. Rather than addressing the allegations that I have made, ULEX and the EU continue to make personal attacks on me and others who have criticized ULEX. I believe that you will want to know the truth about those disciplinary proceedings because they are particularly relevant to other matters that I will tell you about. ULEX and the European External Action Service um, continue to assert that I was found guilty by a disciplinary board of misconduct, that an English court dismissed my claims of misconduct against ULEX and the European External Action Service, and that in consequence, my evidence cannot be accepted as reliable. It is correct that the disciplinary board um, commence proceedings against me. It is correct that the disciplinary board found against me. However, the disciplinary proceedings were a charade. They were initiated by senior staff of the um, EU, who I had accused of serious misconduct. In 2016, a ULEX judge unlawfully accessed my private emails. Copies of my private emails were given to senior staff of the EU. Those emails revealed that I was a whistleblower and that I had reported misconduct to the UK Foreign Office and to the EU Anti-Fraud Agency. It was only after the disclosure of my private emails that the EU commenced disciplinary proceedings against me. The process was designed to give the appearance of being credible and legitimate. However, the process was flawed and it was manipulated by the EU with the um, agreement of members of the disciplinary boards. The persons in charge of the disciplinary proceedings were persons who were in receipt of my private emails and persons I had accused of serious misconduct. The investigators included a former judge of the European Court of Justice. He and other members of the investigation team were in possession of my private emails. This is the famous former judge of the European Court of Justice to which ULEX and the EU often refers. Um, I demanded an independent investigation into the hacking of my emails. That request was refused. Um, instead, an investigation was conducted by ULEX. When I insisted that the former judge of the European Court of Justice um, be interviewed, ULEX closed the investigation. I was given no explanation. I demanded to see the investigation file and was eventually given access uh, to it. When I opened the file, it contained only one document, and that was the notification informing me that ULEX had closed the investigation. Um, the UK Foreign Office has repeatedly asked the EU to open um, an independent investigation into the hacking of my emails, um, but that has never taken place. Um, I want to tell you a little bit more about the disciplinary process, and then I'm going to deal with the, what I know that you all want to hear this morning, which is about um, the interference in criminal trials. And the reason I want to talk about the disciplinary process is because um, you will see, as, as I explain this, how this is relevant to your inquiry. So the allegations against me were referred um, by the people I had accused of misconduct to a board. The board comprised three members. Only one member of the board was a judge. The other two members worked within the EU system and one was employed by the um, very department that started the investigation against me and was subordinate to the people I had accused of misconduct. 
The European um, Court of Human Rights has made it very clear that in disciplinary proceedings against judges, um, there should be at least a majority of judges. That was not um, the case um, in, in the disciplinary proceedings against me. Not only that, but the board ignored important exculpatory evidence, including three witness statements of senior judges. Those statements are not even mentioned in the board's decision. I was also not allowed to interview um, or to examine witnesses um, that the board called. Um, instead, I was sent a summary uh, of their evidence. So the process was a complete sham. I filed appeals against the decision. Um, the appeal board did not um, consider the substance of the allegation. Um, the appeals board ignored um, decisions of the European Court of Human Rights um, and also ignored international conventions and charters. Um, the appeals board ignored Article 6 of the European Convention that gives a uh, defendant a right to a fair trial. Um, so in short, the appeals board was in, was in breach of um, international law. Um, I won't bore you with all of the, the detail um, the, regarding the disciplinary process, um, but what I will tell you is, and I'm sure this will be clear to you by now, that the conduct of the disciplinary proceedings that were taken against me reveal the extent to which the EU is prepared to manipulate process and when necessary to pervert justice in order to achieve a desired result. Um, I'm sure you're asking yourselves why any of this is relevant to your inquiry. Um, it's relevant because it addresses and explains the substance of the allegations that are consistently leveled against me by ULEX and the EU. It is relevant because it demonstrates the EU does not respect a defendant's right to a fair hearing as enshrined under Article 6 of the European Convention. It's relevant because it demonstrates in the clearest possible way that the EU is prepared to manipulate the composition of trial panels to ensure that it can control the outcome. This is something that I'm going to be talking about in a moment. It's relevant because it proves that the EU has little regard for procedural or substantive due process. And it's relevant because it proves that judges serving within the EU system are willing to pervert justice to serve their political masters. And it also shows that EU member states are prepared to condone abuses of justice and rule of law in order to preserve the integrity of the EU and its institutions. Um, ULEX and the EU continue to assert that I failed to, co to cooperate with investigators who were conducting what they describe as an independent investigation into my allegations of misconduct. That is not true. It is correct that I refused to cooperate with the investigators. However, the investigators were not independent and were not impartial. The persons appointed by the EU to lead the investigation into my allegations of misconduct within ULEX um, were the very persons I had accused of misconduct. These were the persons who were in receipt of my private emails. This was never going to be an independent investigation um, and was never intended to be an, an independent investigation. What I think is now clear or should be clear is that the EU will manipulate process to achieve a desired outcome. I raised this with the EU on several occasions. I received no response. Um, now, one thing that is clear is that the ULEX and the EU has never denied my allegations of corruption. Instead, they respond by making personal attacks on me. Um, I now invite ULEX and the EU to cooperate with your investigation um, into these matters. So, and this is not the first time that 
a process, an investigatory process has been manipulated um, within the European External Action Service. Should you decide to open a full inquiry, I will provide you with full details of other occasions when there has been interference um, in investigations. Indeed, I recently received email correspondence in response to a request under the UK Freedom of Information Act, um, which shows that within the EU, there were concerns about the management of the EEAS at that time. So having set the background, let me now tell you um, what I know you want to hear. So in 2014, I was appointed president of ULEX judges and I remained in that post until November, 2017. Um, upon my appointment as president, I met the civilian operations commander, Kenneth Dean in Pristina. During that first meeting in head of missions office, he made it very clear to me, the mission intended removing from political life persons he described as big fish. During that conversation, he said to me, and these are his words, I expect to see ULEX judges convicting those accused by the mission. ULEX judges were, in his words, expected to play their part in ensuring the success of the mission. It became clear to me that success would be measured by the number of convictions. There were also clear political objectives of the mission. For the international community, relations with Serbia and pushing ahead with what the EU um, terms the belgrade pristina dialogue became a priority. Those who stood in the way of the process were seen as obstructionists who had to be removed from positions of power and influence. ULEX judges were the vehicle to achieve this. This was not a rule of law mission, this was a political mission and the ULEX judges were the people who were going to achieve what could not be achieved by political dialogue. When I became president of ULEX judges, I could not understand why so little was being done to prosecute cases against defendants of Serbian ethnicity. Of course, the reality was that many Serbian defendants had fled across the border, but why was it not envisaged that these defendants would appear before an international court, for example, the Kosovo Specialist Chambers? Why was the EU not engaging with Belgrade to ensure that defendants of Serbian ethnicity were brought to justice? Prior to my being appointed president of ULEX judges, I was aware of discussions within ULEX regarding the transfer of files to prosecution authorities in Serbia. These included files that ULEX had received from UNMIC. I was also aware of ongoing discussions between ULEX prosecutors and prosecutors in Serbia. Indeed, ULEX prosecutors traveled to Serbia on several occasions to discuss um, cases with Serbian prosecutors. When I became president in 2014, I discovered that dozens of war crimes files had been handed over um, to prosecution authorities in Serbia. These were investigations into alleged atrocities committed by persons of Serbian ethnicity during the conflict. Those files contained not only details of alleged offenses and perpetrators, but included the personal data of Kosovo citizens who were the victims of these crimes and details of witnesses, some of or most of whom were of Albanian ethnicity and would be entitled to protective measures. These were offenses committed in Kosovo against Kosovo um, citizens by persons of Serbian ethnicity, many of whom were themselves citizens of Kosovo. When I discussed this issue with senior ULEX management, it became clear they knew the Serbian authorities did not have the resources or indeed the will to investigate these crimes. Further, they knew that in reality, it was unlikely these cases would ever be investigated, regardless of what resources were available. ULEX has recently proudly announced that with the cooperation of ULEX, 
the Serbian authorities convicted defendants in one case. That is one case in 10 years, in a mission that has cost millions and millions of euros. In 2018, I was in Serbia working with senior um, Serbian judges and um, senior Serbian prosecutors. They confirmed to me that they had received investigation files from ULEX. Again, should you decide to open an inquiry, I will provide you with full details um, of those meetings. I recognize that the absence of an extradition treaty between Kosovo and Serbia prevented the extradition of Serbian defendants to Kosovo. It became obvious to me the EU wished to avoid a messy confrontation with Serbia regarding the extradition of defendants of Serbian ethnicity at a time when it was engaged in their belgrade pristina dialogue. So why not have Serbian defendants appear before Kosovo specialist chambers? Why not make that a condition precedent of the continuation of EU accession talks? Why did the EU think the solution was simply to have Serbian authorities dealing with those cases, something it knew they had no capacity or will to do? Further, it was made clear to me that not only did the Serbian authorities have no confidence in Kosovo courts to do justice um, in which uh, defendants of Serbian ethnicity were on trial, it had no confidence in the local judiciary to convict Kosovo Albanians charged with war crimes. The Kosovo Specialist Chambers was the mechanism the EU used to engage with Serbia and advance the Pristina-Belgrade dialogue. Indeed, during the dialogue discussions in 2014 and 2015, Serbia was constantly inquiring about the progress of war crime cases against former KLA commanders, including in the so-called Klečka and Drenica cases. Both cases were tried during the dialogue discussions and the success and by success, I mean convictions, were seen by Brussels as critical to the progress of the dialogue. In 2014, I discovered the panel in Drenica had been selected. At that time, I was in charge of the mobile unit. One of the judges assigned uh, to the case was Judge Anna Adamska, a Polish judge. The presiding judge was another Polish judge, Darius Szelitski. It was alleged that judges Szelitski and Adamska were having an affair. This was something that both of them publicly denied. And I want to say that um, to you. They both publicly deny that they were having an affair. Concerns were expressed by other ULEX judges about the way the panel had been selected. I asked to see the decision on selection and the email communications. And it was a very interesting email exchange. On the 29th of May 2014, at 11.37, Judge Szelitski wrote to um, the judge who was in charge of the unit in Mitrovica um, and, and said the following. With relation to the preparation for Drenica, I kindly ask you to consider requesting that the president of assembly of ULEX judges appoint a judge from the mobile unit. Um, to assist him in the case. He doesn't mention a name. Two minutes after, that's two minutes after receiving that email, um, the judge in charge of the Mitrovica unit sends an email to the acting president of ULEX judges um, supporting the request. Five minutes after receiving that email, the acting president gives an instruction to his legal advisor that he draft a decision to appoint to the panel Judge Adamska. Why Judge Adamska? Why not choose one of the other 10 judges then working in the mobile unit? On the 29th of May 2014, I was the senior judge in the mobile unit responsible for assigning judges to cases following a random case allocation system. Judge Adamska was a judge of the mobile unit. I was not consulted which judge was next in line to be assigned a case according to the random case allocation system. 
I was not consulted prior to Judge Adamska being assigned to the case. Interestingly, I was not even uh, copied on any of the email correspondence. There was insufficient time between Judge Sprenger, who was the acting president, receiving that email and his responding to the request two minutes later to make any inquiries to determine the availability of Judge Damska or to inquire of me what other case or trial commitments she had. Clearly there had been other communications between this group and the email exchange was designed to give the appearance of pr um, propriety. I subsequently spoke with Judge Sprenger and I asked him why Judge Adamska had been chosen and why I had not been consulted. He said he thought I knew about the assignment of Judge Adamska. I told him I did not. I asked, I asked him to rescind um, the appointment and he refused. And this is important. He told me the mission was pleased with the panel composition and that having judges Shalitsky and Adamska on the Drenitsa trial panel would, in his words, get the right result. In 2017, the Supreme Court of Kosovo, with a majority of ULEX judges, rejected the application of defense counsel to hear my evidence regarding the composition of the trial panel. In 2018, the Constitutional Court of Kosovo found the Supreme Court in breach of Article 6 of the European Convention on Human Rights because it had not heard my evidence. This was an EU rule of law mission found to have breached a defendant's right to a fair trial. Um, as previously stated, Drenitsa was not the only case um, that the EU considered important as part of the belgrade pristina dialogue. In 2013, I was um, uh, appointed uh, as the presiding judge in the case known as Kletchka. And this was the war crime case for 10 defendants, um, including the prominent politician Fatmir Limay. The first trial panel ended with a trial um, headed by, a, by another British judge, um, finding there was insufficient evidence against the accused. The vice president of ULEX judges wasted no time in expressing his um, unhappiness about the acquittals in Kletchka and the fact that in his words, member states expected convictions. Member states expected convictions. More than once I was told by mission management that if we did not increase the number of convictions, member states would be unable to justify the huge expense and that we would all be out of a job. Indeed, mission audits always focused on the number of convic convictions. Mission audits were about how many convictions do you have? What were the length of sentences? I was never asked how many successful trials had your unit conducted, but how many convictions? Fair trials were not enough to convince member states to continue their engagement with ULEX and Kosovo. What mattered, the only thing that mattered were, were convictions. Kletschka went on appeal and the um, acting president uh, appointed himself president of the appeal panel. The appeal panel reversed um, the trial judge's findings and sent the case for retrial. Um, and I was appointed presiding judge in the retrial. The political significance of Kletchka for the mission was highlighted to me um, in an email that I received on the 29th of January, 2013, from the then president of the Assembly of ULEX judges, Charles Smith, in which he asked me to list the case for trial as quickly as possible um, for what he described as, and these are his words in the email, a number of reasons, most of them political. So I was being asked to list a case for trial for a number of reasons, most of them 
political. And those political reasons were the dialogue and the EU's relationship with Serbia. Having been appointed to the trial panel in 2013, I was, in, I was instructed, uh, sorry, I was informed by Charles Smith that the mission had, in his words, a lot riding on the outcome of the case. He said the mission, in his words, expected convictions. He further suggested that my job might be in jeopardy if the defendants were not convicted. I reported that conversation with Charles Smith to the UK Embassy in Kosovo in an email on the 11th of July, 2013. I subsequently met the UK Deputy Ambassador to discuss interference in trials by senior ULEX staff. Um, because of my obligations under the UK Official Secrets Act, I cannot go into detail now about that conversation. In four separate cases, it was alleged by different ULEX judges that Charles Smith had attempted to interfere in the outcome of criminal trials. Those allegations are documented. Should you decide to open um, a full inquiry, I will provide you with the documentary evidence uh, in relation to all four of those cases. Um, it was not only Judge Smith who attempted to interfere in cases. As president of ULEX judges, I regularly attended meetings with ULEX head of mission. The mission continued to determine the success of the mission by the number of convictions and the number of high profile defendants who were imprisoned. There were many occasions when ULEX judges issued decisions with which head of mission disagreed. After each such ruling at a meeting with head of mission, I was asked, is the judge seconded or contracted? The implication was obvious. If the judge was contracted, it would be easier to get rid of them. On several occasions, I was told that judges should be sent home after making decisions head of mission disagreed with. Um, I was specifically instructed not to appoint judges to high profile cases who had previously acquitted defendants. In his opinion, these judges could not be trusted. Assignment of judges became a regular battle with head of mission. When a high profile case was listed for trial, I would be asked to, si to assign a sympathetic judge to the case. ULEX head of mission subsequently insisted on changes to the random case allocation system to give me more power uh, to reassign cases. He told me that he expected me to assign cases to judges in whom the mission could have confidence to convict. On several occasions, I was told that in cases where the prosecution evidence was weak, a conviction could still be obtained by assigning a judge who understood why he was there. An acquittal was perceived as failure. As I have already stated, ULEX and the EU measure success by the number of convictions. ULEX judges were even accused of corruption if they made decisions unpopular with mission management. In several documented cases, allegations of corruption were made against ULEX judges who made decisions unpopular with the mission. Um, should you decide to open a full inquiry, I will also provide you with evidence about an internal um, ULEX investigation into corruption involving interference in criminal cases and attempts by senior staff in Brussels to frustrate that investigation. It was not only ULEX judges who came under pressure, ULEX prosecutors were also under pressure to pursue cases against high profile defendants even when there was insufficient evidence. ULEX prosecutors were rarely independent in decision-making. Instructions about which cases to prosecute and how those cases would be prosecuted were taken at management meetings. In the same way that mission management had preferred judges, it also had preferred prosecutors. <clears throat> I attended weekly briefings with ULEX head of mission, head of executive division, and the chief ULEX prosecutor. During those meetings, ULEX cases were discussed. Head of mission used those meetings to instruct ULEX prosecutors on mission priorities and which cases to prosecute. 
it also became clear that there was a constant dialogue between Brussels head of mission and ULEX prosecutors about which cases to pursue. It was also clear that embassies of EU member states in Kosovo were in regular communication with ULEX, um, in particular head of mission regarding cases and individuals that were of particular interest to them. Again, should you decide to open an inquiry, I will provide you with further details, um, including emails. Following the creation of the Kosovo Specialist Chambers, I began to hear rumors circulating around senior mission management that Brussels was unhappy with a specialist prosecutor, David Schwendemann, because his office had not filed indictments. It was suggested that the prosecutor's office thought the evidence against several former high-ranking KLA members was at best weak. I was told that discussions were ongoing in Brussels with a view to Mr. Schwendemann being replaced by someone who could, in the words of ULEX mission management, be trusted. Again, in due course, I will provide you with evidence of those discussions. Protection of witnesses was also a matter of concern to me and other ULEX judges. Again, I have to be careful about the information I reveal at this stage. Um, simply because I do not wish to state publicly anything that might compromise the safety of a protected witness. What I can tell you is that initially, ULEX failed to put in place adequate measures to address security and welfare concerns of protected witnesses. In one high profile case, this is a war crime case, um, the ULEX Witness Protection Unit gave me access to a protected witness file. It revealed a catalog of errors by ULEX that culminated in the death of a protected witness. Um, it, were I to reveal information about that at this stage, um, I would be getting into hot water, um, but I'm sure that um, the UK and the EU uh, will wish to fully cooperate with your inquiry uh, in relation to that matter. Although the handling of protected witnesses has improved, the reality is that neither ULEX nor the Kosovo specialist chambers can guarantee the safety of protected witnesses or their families. Um, apart from the obvious safety concerns, I also became concerned about the reliability of some protected witnesses. Several witnesses who had been given protected measures claimed ULEX had promised that they and their families would be relocated to an EU member state if they gave evidence for the prosecution. In some cases, those relationships were open to abuse. It became I believe to some, an invitation to fabricate evidence and lie. On some occasions, the promises turned out to be worthless. In some cases, the attractive inducements on offer to witnesses would inevitably result in witnesses perjuring themselves, in other words, lying on oath in order to secure a better life for themselves and for their families. In other cases, it was alleged that witnesses had been threatened by investigators. The former head of ULEX Criminal Intelligence Office, Michael Rawlinson, expressed concern about the reliability of some protected witnesses. He had been contacted by several witnesses who had been offered inducements to give statements or, it was alleged, had been threatened. He and I met several times to discuss these cases. Michael Rawlinson conducted a detailed investigation and interviewed many witnesses. During one of our meetings, he told me that he was doing this, in his words, off the grid, by which I understood that this was not an official investigation. He had codenamed his investigation Trojan Horse, which I thought was quite appropriate. Mr. Rawlinson shared much of his investigation with me. Because some of those cases are ongoing, I cannot provide you with specific details at this stage. However, in due course, again, should you open a full inquiry, I will provide you with information. Kletchka and Grenison were not the only sensitive war crime cases in which ULEX management attempted to interfere. There were other documented cases, and it was not just war crime cases. 
I receive complaints from ULEX judges about interference in criminal cases and serious irregularities in criminal proceedings. In 2017, there were attempts by mission management to bring forward the trial of Oliver Ivanovich for what were overtly political reasons. During one of my regular meetings with ULEX head of mission and the then head of executive division, head of mission pushed me to bring that case forward for trial, leapfrogging all other cases. Um, head of mission made it very clear to me that she did not want Mr. Ivanovich participating in upcoming municipality elections. I refused. On the 7th of July, 2017, I received an email from the ULEX head of executive division in which referring to the Ivanovich case, she said to me, these are her words, Mitrovica team is back into the attention. I am getting questions whether the trial will be finished until October, and this is the important bit, when we possibly have municipality elections. When we possibly have municipality elections, can you please find out what is happening? We met several days later when again, head of executive division tried to put pressure on me to bring the Ivanovich trial forward. I was constantly the buffer between um, ULEX senior management, EEAS staff in Brussels um, and the ULEX judges. Um, several other points I want to raise with you, Chairman, please excuse me, I know I probably overrun my time, um, but I will be very quick, um, just a, a couple more matters. Um, one thing that was of particular concern to me whilst we're talking about Mitrovica is the fact that trial panels in Mitrovica comprised only ULEX judges. That was contrary to the law. The law referred to trial panels comprising a majority of ULEX judges. The lawfulness of all decisions of ULEX only panels in Mitrovica is therefore, in my opinion, highly questionable. There were also issues involving ULEX judges being transferred to superior courts without the knowledge and approval of the Kosovo Judicial Council and without formal appointment by the president. Many decisions were issued by ULEX judges who were not lawfully appointed to the courts in which they were presiding, including the Court of Appeals. Defendants were convicted by defendants, sorry, defendants were convicted by ULEX judges um, who had no lawful authority to hear those cases. When I became president of ULEX judges, I instructed those judges to stop work immediately and ordered a review of those cases. I've tried to summarize just some of the matters that I think are relevant to your inquiry. Um, should you decide to open a full inquiry, there are other matters that I will refer to. Um, I realize that some of you will be frustrated by the fact that I cannot provide specific um, detail or provide you with the names of particular cases. Uh, this is for a very obvious reason. Um, some of those investigations are ongoing, and I believe that some of the people involved in these cases may be under other criminal investigations, and I do not wish to obstruct those investigations. Um, I'm also conscious of the fact that um, I'm subject to the UK Official Secrets Act. Um, as I previously stated, I am not alone in expressing concerns about justice and rule of law under ULEX. There are others out there who have contacted me and who wish to give evidence as part of a full inquiry. Um, the other day I was contacted by the former ULEX international prosecutor, Maria Bamier, um, who asked me to pass on her respects to the committee and inform you of her willingness um, to cooperate. Um, she will give evidence about um, a number of issues, including interference in criminal trials. She will also give evidence about the transfer of cases to Serbia 
and those discussions. There are many matters that I think she will be able to assist your inquiry with. I'm also confident that there are others out there who would wish to give evidence to the committee. Those persons will include Kosovo Albanian former ULEX staff members. Um, should you decide to open um, an inquiry, um, I, I would encourage you to ask those members to come forward. And I would respectfully invite you to consider granting whatever special measures you are able to do in order um, that those persons can give evidence without fear of reprisals and repercussions of the type that I have been subjected to. Um, I'm, I'm out of time, I know. Um, there are other matters that I would like to talk about, um, but I'm willing to answer any questions that you may have for me. Uh, fine, there is so Thank you very much, Mr. Simmons, for your presentation and your willingness to share your opinions with the MPs and the members of the Committee on Legislation. Now we will continue with any questions that the MPs might have to for Mr. Simmons with regard to the issues you raised and the issues you have publicly raised regarding the EULEX mission in Kosovo. Whomever wants to take the floor or has a question, please feel free to make those questions and present them here. Mr. Bechai. Mr. Bechai has the floor. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Simmons, for your readiness to report to this commission, Mr. Simmons. In my opinion, it was this statement by you was of utmost importance for the public opinion. I appreciate what you said uh, when you said that in addition to this hearing, you are also willing to declare if the Assembly of Kosovo decides to launch a full inquiry specifically about the issues covered under the secrecy law. I would like to thank you on behalf of the parliamentary group of PDK. I'm Haidar Bejai, an MP of the Assembly of Kosovo. Mr. Simmons, the majority of the questions that we had prepared, you explained in your presentation. However, I would like to pose some questions and maybe you can avoid what you already said, just not to repeat them. By the end of your mandate, as the head, uh, president of the Lex court, you were subjected to disciplinary procedures, which were finally decided against you. Why do you think you were subjected to such disciplinary proceedings? You did say that in your experience, second countries had a lot of interest on in LX activity. So what was the nature of relations between LX employees and their states or the embassies that had put them there? What were the expectations from LX judges and prosecutors from their countries, secondary countries and the EU? You mentioned this, but however, I will just lie my questions. Have you or your colleagues experienced any pressure from member state or LX to prioritize specific cases for political purposes? If so, could you provide an example? I know you gave the examples of the Drenica case and the Klitschka case where a pressure was exacted upon you. You know that a lot of submissions regarding alleged crimes perpetrated by Serbians were transferred to Serbia despite the ambiguous and the lack of willingness of Serbia to adjudicate these cases what is your opinion? Why did the Olex judge send these cases done by Serbian ethnic people? And I can say that all of these cases were done by Serbians. Why did not Olex adjudicate these cases, but then send them to Serbia where they lacked willingness? Has, have you or your colleagues experienced pressure from Olex or member states to 
make sentences and punishments. You responded to this. In your experience, did OLEX prefer a specific group of judges who would be more inclined to impose punishments? At the beginning of your mandate as a president, you noticed that Judge Adams was appointed to the Drenica case. Why was this done in your opinion? You said that you have raised concerns regarding the composition of the trial panel in the case Drenica in the management, uh, mission management and your state. So why were there no measure taken on this issue? What were the consequences uh, with for people who testified have you testified in the Drenica 2 case are you informed that in this case there are 10 people who were sentenced with over 40 years of imprisonment despite the procedural violation by the mission was there a violation of the law by the trial panel in the case Trenica 1 and Trenica 2, where you were the head of the Evlex assembly, was the law on the establishment of trial bodies upheld and implemented? You said before, and you've said even earlier, that the decision of the constitutional court on the Trenica case, Trenica 2 case was not respected, was their tendencies not to implement the decision of the constitutional court in this case by Aulex or second cases or cases that had delegated judges. In the Klitschka case, you mentioned to Mr. Limai, so I would like to ask you now, in your opinion, was the success of the mission related to the punishments that were imposed because it seems like the success of the mission was more related to the expenditure so what you said it would the case was not related to how many proofs were there for punishment but rather that the mission wanted to have a higher number of punishments in order to exert or have more funds I have a few more questions. I have a question. You mentioned before that the uh, second countries have requested for information. What kind of information was exchanged between OLEX employees and the states that had delegated them, them to the mission? Was this information sensitive information? I'm referring to information shared by judges to the embassies. You said that there was a dialogue between Brussels, head of the mission, and OLEX prosecutors. So in terms of what cases should be prosecuted, to your information, did this influence the achievement of EU objectives in the region. In your experience, Mr. Simmons, was there any proof about the indictments that were prioritized based on political belongings or based on high profile political figures? Can you provide examples? You actually already mentioned some examples, but I'm sure there are other examples as well. Considering everything, to what extent do you believe that OLEX is capable or should be considered fair and unbiased. So for, based on what you said and based on the question, to what extent is OLEX fair and unbiased in the Republic of Kosovo? Taking everything into account, to what extent do you believe that the mandate and the initiative for the rule of law related to the OLEX mission can be or should be considered as fair and unbiased? How did OLEX protect witnesses or information. In your experience, were OLEX employees informed of proper measures to check documents, the practices, proper practices of protecting witnesses? You mentioned that you raised concerns about the lack of measures to protect witnesses or sensitive information. What was the purpose of Brussels or OLEX employees when these issues were brought to their attention? Were witnesses ever put under pressure to testify 
pursuant to the claims of Eulex prosecutors? If yes, what kind of pressure was exerted against them? Were there any fabricated, fabricated uh, witnesses just to ensure a higher case number rather than quality? Were there Serbian witnesses who have falsely testified? How you managed and why did you say that the uh, falsified witness were being put into these procedures? And finally, not to take any more of your time, because maybe uh, I made a lot of questions and most of them you've answered. You said that you, other people also raised your concerns. So why were you not able to properly raise these concerns to change the practices of AULAX with regard to sensitive or protected witnesses or information. Once again, Mr. Simmons, I would like to thank you very much for everything you shared with the Assembly of the Republic of Kosovo and with the citizens of the Republic of Kosovo. As an MP of the Assembly, I'm highly concerned with regard to the Eulex mission in Kosovo, who is supposed to be trustworthy and able to reach fair decisions rather than decisions dictated by other circles. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Bechai. Now we move on to the answer surface Mr. Simmons, because Mr. Bechai had a range of questions, a series of questions for which uh, we expect Mr. Simons to answer. So please, other MPs, kindly be requested that on the issues that already were contained in the presentation, please save him from these questions. Each one of you are free to use your time to ask questions. Mr. Simons, over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I'll touch upon the questions that um, I haven't already answered, or if it's a slightly different question uh, to the information that I provided. Um, firstly, thank you, Mr. Betchai, for your questions. Um, forgive me if I've forgotten any of the questions, but in terms of the, the disciplinary process, that was a, a contrived process that was designed simply to remove me. Um, I was seen as, as trouble. Um, I was not someone who was falling into line with other judges. Um, and so the entire process was designed basically to get rid of me. Um, you asked about embassies and about communications with embassies. Um, I can tell you that there were regular meetings um, between ULEX judges and prosecutors um, and their embassies. Um, I attended the UK embassy every week and I met with the ambassador um, or his deputy every week. Um, apart from those meetings, I was in very regular communication with senior staff of the UK embassy. Um, what I can tell you is that cases were discussed. Um, that is as much as I can tell you at the moment um, without breaching the UK Official Secrets Act. Um, I am confident that the UK government will waive my obligations under the UK Official Secrets Act in order that I can provide you with full details of what was discussed. I also know um, that, as I say, other judges and prosecutors were meeting with their embassies um, and several ULEX judges reported to me uh, meetings with their embassies. Um, I also have emails from um, ULEX head of mission that contain a paper um, email trail um, from embassies um, regarding specific cases that were of interest. Um, I'm also aware that um, during meetings with head of mission, um, there were there was regular reference to certain embassies um, expressing particular interest in certain cases. Um, in terms of transfer of cases to Serbia, I'm not sure I can say very much more than that, and the, the one I've already said. Um, and you will, if you choose to open a full inquiry, hear from um, other people on the prosecution side. 
um, who were um, who have far more information than I do um, about that. Um, you asked me about whether ULEX preferred um, a specific group of judges. The answer is yes. Um, there were certain judges, particularly judges from Eastern European countries, um, that um, Head of Missions Office particularly liked. Um, and the reason for that is, is actually very simple. Um, those judges were earning significantly more um, in an international mission than they would have been earning at home. They were also um, not working as hard um, in ULEX as they would have been working at home. Um, so this was a particularly attractive mission for them. None of those judges wanted this mission to end. Um, and, and I'm afraid that some of them, not all of them, some of them were prepared to do whatever was necessary in order to make sure that they remained part of this mission. Um, you, you mentioned Drenitsa. Drenitsa was critical um, for the continuation of the belgrade pristina um, dialogue. Um, Kletchka, likewise. Kletchka is a case that, in my opinion, should never have gone to trial. Um, I cannot think of any country in the world um, where a trial or a case on such weak evidence would have seen the inside of a courtroom. Um, that case cost millions of euros to prosecute um, and a case that stood little chance of success. Um, I don't want to sort of rehearse the judgment in Kletchka, um, but the case was based upon the evidence of one witness who had a history of mental illness, um, who had died before the trial started, um, and whose evidence was contradicted not only by his own evidence in the form of diary entries, but also by forensic evidence. Um, if that case had been started in England, it would have been laughed out of court. Um, but it continued because it was important for the dialogue. That was the only reason. Um, you've asked about protected witnesses. Um, ULEX, as I've said, was unable to guarantee um, the protection of witnesses or their families. That is the reality. Um, this is not the United States where you can move a witness from New York to Los Angeles and they disappear. Um, Kosovo, you know better than I do, is a, is, a, is a small country, a very close knit community. Um, and everyone knows everyone else's business a, a lot of the time. Um, and it's very difficult for somebody to disappear but you know that better than I do. When I raised this um, in Brussels, um, I was told that there was nothing that could be done in terms of A, increasing protective measures for witnesses, um, but B, most importantly, um, protecting witnesses after they'd given evidence. So once they'd given evidence, the file was closed. What became of that file? What became of the evidence that was in the file? Um, and of course, one of the reasons that ULEX existed was because, quite frankly, there was no confidence in the local judiciary. Um, and there was a perception that information would be leaked to defendants and others. So my question was to Brussels, well, look, what do we do with the information that is in those files? We need to change the law. We need to have some special measures in place. And the response I had from um, somebody um, in Brussels was, was simply this. Well, you know, there's nothing really we can do, but do we really care? The witness has given evidence, they've served their purpose, um, and they pretty much take their chances. That was the response that I received. I was not happy, as you can imagine, with that response. And I raised it with the head of executive division, Yaroslava Novotna, who was very supportive. And her view was that um, 
measures had to be put in place to protect witnesses at the end of the ULEX mission. Um, we raised this with um, head of mission, whose response was, well, we just destroy everything, shred everything. Um, and I had to remind him that these were court files, these were official documents. We cannot simply shred court files. So there were no measures um, in place um, to properly protect um, witnesses. You asked me whether I think that ULEX is fair and unbiased. Well, my simple answer is that there are people working within ULEX who are decent, honest people who are doing their best um, for Kosovo. You know, they came to Kosovo um, wanting to do good. Um, but unfortunately, um, there are a lot of people in there who basically want to line their pockets with gold. Um, you know, they see this as, a, as an opportunity to make quite a lot of money, um, and they have very little interest in, um, uh, in Kosovo or the people of Kosovo. Um, and um, the, the, do I, would I have confidence in a, in a court to do justice? Well, the simple answer is no. Um, I have as much confidence in the Kosovo Specialist Chambers as I would in a court in Iran um, or in Russia. That is the level of confidence that I have um, in the Kosovo Specialist Chambers. Um, I've tried to answer, I think, all of your questions, um, others that I, I think I've previously answered um, in, in my testimony. Sorry, I'm, I'm, only, I'm only getting Albanian, I'm not getting English translation. Apologies. Thank you, Mr. Simmons. Based on what, so once again, thank you, Mr. Simmons. You were uh, very concrete and specific in this report and also in the responses to the question. It is obvious that punishments were mainly political, we degraded and falsified evidences. And we can see that the same evidence have been recycled in the Republic of Kosovo, particularly about political decisions in relation to the KLA. Often the same degraded uh, evidence have been used in different court proceedings and the specialized chambers are using the very same evidence. I have a specific question for you, Mr. Simmons. If you were to be invited in the capacity of a witness from the specialized chambers in HOG, would you testify on this issue? Thank you very much. And Yes, is the simple answer. Yes, I'd be happy to um, to assist the court at the Hague should they ask me to to give evidence. We continue with Mr. Zemai. Thank you, Chairman of the Commission. Honored, Mr. Simmons. Greetings to you. I'm Armen Zemai. I'm an MP of the Assembly of Republic of Kosovo. In fact, your statements have raised a lot of confusion about the OLEX mission, particularly in rule of law and the executive part of justice, or better say judiciary and prosecution in the Republic of Kosovo by the simple fact that this interview today, I think, would help clarify the situation and provide us an outlook into the background of LLEX, given that they had executive power over the judiciary in Kosovo. All of the claims that you raised today are particularly concerning for me because we believed and hoped that the OLEX mission would serve justice and help prepare judges and prosecutors, local judges and prosecutors, so that in the future would be competent 
and independent in serving justice in Kosovo without uh, prejudicing that this uh, statement of you is personal because of your past. I think that we need additional information or better say, we need closed session testimonies where we can obtain information about processes that have undergone in Kosovo of people in Kosovo have undergone in their claim for justice in the criminal justice of system in Kosovo. The topics that you raised, I will try to make them as questions, if I may. You are speaking about the LX mission, speaking about the embassies, but you're not mentioning the US embassy or the role of the US in the LX mission. Now, I would like to ask you if you could tell us if you have raised these concerns to the US embassy or whether you've only shared these concerns with the British embassy, the country of origin, origin for you. Now, although you might have raised these concerns only in your country of origin, why did you not also address them to the US embassy? Because personally, me and the people in Kosovo believe in their role, be that political or in the justice sector in Kosovo particularly about the cases that you mentioned or cases that were topic of discussion in Kosovo, which included prosecutor judges or investigators coming from the US on these alleged cases. You mentioned that there were interference in criminal investigation. You said that there was manipulation of proofs. I would like to ask you about some other topics, however. We have a report from an investigating group, US-based, which also included uh, some investigators from Great Britain, specifically Gary Fransworth, political crime investigator who has brought a report on the politically based murders of the officials of the Democratic League of Kosovo in Kosovo. Now, I would like to ask you if you could provide uh, any information as a president of the LX judge on what has happened with this report. Uh, where do the investigation stand at this point, particularly by the pretrial judges where prosecutors, and I will reiterate this, prosecutors were both from the Great Britain and the United States of America. There were also judges and prosecutors from Eastern countries, which you raised the concerns were not very interested to deliver justice or uncover crimes committed in Kosovo. I hope that you have an opinion, if you have something to say on these issues that I raised, because you were speaking only on one portion of alleged criminal offenses, but you left out anything on crimes against political figures, specifically people from my party, Democratic League of Kosovo, and supporters of the President Ibrahim Rogova, different figures uh, whose murders are yet to be cleared in Kosovo. So we're there political interference on these cases. What information do you have available? Who may have made these interferences? Are there local people or international? Have corruption investigation been related to non-disclosure and failure to disclose the perpetrators and the ones who ordered these atrocities? And I believe that you as president of the Airlex judges, could provide some sort of explanation if you have something to add on these issues. I believe that the information that you brought forward should be raised to executive level before the government of the Republic of Kosovo with regard to the LX mission, which as you know, is still in Kosovo and this should also be raised before the EU office in order to 
request an independent inquiry on your allegations, because to me, they are very concerning, given that such interference, particularly on criminal cases, as you mentioned and reiterated, serve to advance political parties, actually put a shadow over the international institutions, but also in terms of the role and the capacities that the government of Kosovo aims to achieve in terms of independent justice. Thank you for your willingness. And I hope and believe, and I want to believe that what you said is not personal just to cleanse yourself, but rather I want to believe that these are based on principle and our concerns that you have addressed during your mandate, although maybe not publicly, but I, I believe you have addressed to your country of origin and to other countries particularly to the Quint states, which have a prevailing role in the political life and institutional life and the justice system in the Republic of Kosovo. Thank you very much. The floor to you, Mr. Simmons, and then we will Thank continue you, with other. Um, just the last point you make um, where you, you say, I mean, quite, quite correctly, that you hope that the reason I'm here today is not for sort of a personal vendetta um, and, and and that's an entirely proper and correct question um, because uh, over the past um, several years people have said to me well you know why are you making these allegations now you know why why now are you are you sort of raising these issues the, the, the fact is I've been raising these concerns since uh, at least two uh, at least 2013. Um, and in fact, when I was going through some emails um, recently, um, I discovered emails going back to 2008. 2008, when I arrived in Kosovo, um, I started firing off emails to the UK Foreign Office expressing concerns about one thing or another. Most of those were not about corruption or misconduct, but I think it was um, it was about sort of 2013 that it became very clear to me that things had gone very badly wrong. Um, and so for the people who sort of say, well, you know, this is all just kind of new, you're only raising this now, or you only raised this after disciplinary proceedings were taken against you, that's completely not the case. Um, so I just wanted to address that point that you raised. Um, you also um, say, why didn't I go to the US Embassy? Well, as again, as you as you refer to, um, being, a, being a British citizen um, and an employee of the UK Foreign Office, um, it, I would go to my employer and my employer was the, the UK Embassy um, in Kosovo. So that was my first port of call. Um, and and I, I'm sure that had I gone to the US embassy, they would have probably sent me straight back to the, um, to the UK embassy. Um, but I accept that um, I think in Kosovo, the US embassy first and the UK embassy second um, seemed to command most support of the, the public. Um, and I think for those for that reason, um, the US and the UK um, should be pushing for an inquiry into justice and rule of law. Um, I, I'm afraid that what has happened up until this point is that um, the UK in particular has chosen political expediency over justice and rule of law. So they have decided that the UK relationship um, with the EU um, is more important than justice and rule of law. Um, I will say no more than that at this stage. Um, in terms of the report that you refer to, um, I can't answer your question. Um, and also in terms of political interference in cases, um, I've answered, I've given you some examples of political interference um, from the international perspective 
In terms of local interference, again, I, I can't really answer that question. Um, but I know that um, were there to be a full inquiry, I think Maria Bamier is going to be telling the committee about political interference um, in certain cases. Um, I don't want to say any more than that because I don't want to sort of give evidence for her. Um, but I mean, I think clearly she will be in a better position to tell you about political interference. And she might, and I, I don't know, but she might be able to answer um, some of the questions that you have raised. Um, I hope, Mrs. Amai, that answers, at least in part, the questions that you've, you've asked me. Thank you, Mr. Simmons. Mr. Pollekai has requested the floor. Thank you, Chairman. Honored colleague MPs, honored Mr. Simmons. What imp impressed me the most as an MP, we used to think, or it seems like Eulex was here to discipline our politicians and not to serve justice. My direct question on this issue would be, was Eulex established and does Eulex in Kosovo serve selective justice? Do they serve to discipline politicians who bear responsibilities in Kosovo? And when you mentioned the dialogue between Pristina and Belgrade, I think it was implied by you that Eulex and other courts are in fact here only to affect the dialogue and intimidate our politicians who think differently. So after the abundant information that you provided, it makes no sense for anyone to think that this mission, in fact, in Kosovo serves justice, and this mission in Kosovo has completed its obligation and therefore created ambiguity among the citizens of Kosovo. You mentioned the Drenica case before, and I know that in that case, a Polish judge was involved, Mr. Sielinski, where the defendants were called as animals that need to be tamed. Um, ULEX is not a rule of law mission. ULEX is a political mission that arrived in Kosovo under the sort of the, the, the pretense of being a rule of law mission. You see, you, you, ULEX would never exist if it said, we're a political mission. We're here to achieve political objectives. It's, it's kind of the, the sheep in, in wolf's clothing. It's, um, you know, it, it is as Michael Rawlinson described um, protected witnesses, it's the, it's the Trojan horse. Um, it arrived um, in Kosovo um, pretending to want to support justice and rule of law. Um, but it had a distinct political agenda. Um, and ULEX judges were the vehicle to achieve political objectives. That is very clear. Um, I mean, in terms of the the dialogue. Um, I mean, the, the EU pretends to be a major player on the world stage, and it's clearly hugely influential. Um, and the benefits for the people of Kosovo of EU accession are huge. And, and I totally understand that. And I totally understand why um, Kosovo citizens, young and old, would want to be a part of the EU. But it comes at a huge price. Um, and I, I think 
what we have seen from the international community and the way that it behaves in Kosovo is the sheer level of, of bullying that takes place. You know, um, we see the way that it is conduct, the EU is conducting the, the dialogue process. Um, Serbia and Kosovo are not treated as being on equal terms. Um, and it, it's, it's important and it's correct that Kosovo stands up for itself because Kosovo is an independent country. It's an independent sovereign state. And it's about time everyone realized that. Um, and of course, what we see in The Hague is um, we see a court that was established by the EU um, to sort of demonstrate that the EU has arrived, a court that would rival the, you know, the ICC. But I mean, the reality is that it is, it is very far from that in terms of how the court operates. And I know that there are huge concerns um, within the international community about the, the levels of competence in the Kosovo specialist chambers, um, but also the way that justice is administered within the, um, within the chambers. Um, and that needs to be addressed. But it also needs to be, there needs to be challenges from Kosovo, from the government of Kosovo, as to how that court is operating. Because quite frankly, it is an ethnic court. That is what it is there. It's there to punish um, Albanians. It's there to punish former KLA commanders? Where are the Serbian defendants? Um, you know, where is the EU court um, to do justice for those of Serbian ethnicity who committed crimes um, in Kosovo? Um, and there are thousands and thousands of people in Kosovo who are victims of atrocities committed during the conflict who have not seen justice Justice has failed them. And you and I um, both thought, or we all thought that, you know, the EU mission in Kosovo was going to fix things. You know, I joined that mission full of hope that I was going to come there. We were together going to turn things around and justice was going to be done. And instead, what happened was um, we discovered an inept, impotent, incompetent mission that achieved little um, and undermined justice and rule of law. Um, I totally understand why its mandate has been extended until 2023, and that's because it's political expediency. Um, you know, we, the government of Kosovo can't just kick the EU out because it needs them. Um, but I'm delighted and relieved that ULEX no longer has an executive mandate, because whilst it had an executive mandate, um, it simply served to undermine justice and rule of law. And it's correct that um, that is gone. And I'm only sorry that I was actually a part of that. Um, and, you know, there were some of us within the mission who fought to improve things. And quite frankly, we failed, you know, um, and, and the mission was a failure. You talk about Drenica. I mean, Drenica and Kletchka, and, and there are other war crime cases, um, bring shame on the international community. Um, Kletchka should never have gone to trial. There is no doubt that, um, Serbian prisoners, not all of the defendants, some of the defendants, if not on all of the counts, some of the counts. And then we can sort of wave this to Serbia and say, hey, look, guys, you know, we are doing our bit in, in Kosovo. Um, but I was shocked by comments that were made by my international colleagues about um, Kosovo Albanian citizens. Um, and, you know, those people have no place in a rule of law mission. Um, and, you know, I worked for, for many years with Kosovo Albanian judges. And, you know, you've got some very smart people 
Um, and you've got some people who, you know, the younger judges who are coming into the system are really working hard to improve things. Um, and you sort of take your hat off to them. Um, you know, uh, some of the older judges, you know, they've now left the system. And I think we've got a new dynamic group of people um, coming into the system who will improve things, who want to see, who, who want to see change. And they need the support of the international community in terms of training in order to make them better judges. But from my perspective, what's most important is not what they know when they come into the system, because we can train those judges. What's important is that the judges coming into the system are decent and honest. And that's critical. Everything else follows. Um, and, you know, I have a huge amount of respect for um, the Kosovo Albanian judges um, who are working hard in difficult circumstances, um, but were constantly being attacked by the international um, community. Um, and it's about time the international community started supporting the institutions rather than bullying um, and um, behaving like, um, you know, behaving in a sort of a, a sort of an offhandish way um, to people who are doing their best. Um, I hope I've answered at least in part your, your questions. Thank you very much. Before I pass the floor over to the deputy chair uh, of the committee, Mr. Dritan Salman, I have one short question, Mr. Simas. Was there any case during your tenure, during the, uh, your presence at the ELEX mission, where, whereby you, 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 noti you, not you notified Kosovo authorities about these violations, such as Assembly of Kosovo government or the president? Did at least uh, uh, before the uh, adoption of the law on ratification of the agree agreement on ULEX mission in Kosovo in 2016. So basically, uh, in, in, in capacity of ULEX member, did you ever have an opportunity of informing Kosovo authorities? Were Kosovo authorities aware on, related to these matters? And this is the, um, sorry, you're referring to the composition of, of panels. You'll no, basically, during the time when you were serving in the mission, while you were part of the mission in any capacity, uh, in, in the course of your uh, work, did you ever notify Kosovo authorities about these ir irregularities and about these wrongdoings? Were Kosovo authorities uh, aware? You said you, you had notified the EU by sending emails and British yeah. Embassy. Um, but did you ever inform Kosovo authorities on these uh, wrongdoings? Um, the simple answer is no. Um, I mean, I, the EU were informed, or the uh, ULEX was informed. Um, the European External Action Service was informed. Um, the UK Embassy was informed. Um, the um, Anti-Fraud Agency in Brussels was informed. Um, and latterly, um, in 2017, um, EU member states were informed. Um, but I'm, I'm now trying to remember, but I do not recall ever specifically raising um, a formal um, complaint or report um, to, the, to the Kosovo authorities. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Simas. Over to uh, MP Darita Salmana. Thank you very much. Greetings to Mr. Simmons. Uh, in fact, it's a, a, a not so typical for the Kosovo Assembly to address uh, uh, to a, a former employee of a justice system, either a few lakhs of Kosovo. This is the first time happening. Uh, so this is, uh, I, it's very um, interesting, both in terms of the uh, testimony and uh, in terms of the topic. So I'm very uh, sorry that there, there's more confusion being spread. Uh, the credibility of persons living in Kosovo was very weak and on the uh, on presence, and particularly the justice uh, sector and 
and both of you likes as well. So I have uh, several questions. The first, first question goes as to why did you choose this time uh, to provide testimony or to address the assembly uh, with those information? Why didn't, didn't you do it before to uh, simply share this information with us? Secondly, um, there was an investigation launched against you by EOLEX, launched by EOLEX. What were the allegations uh, uh, against you? And do you have any uh, other inve ongoing investigation uh, pressed or launched against you by EU institutions? Thirdly, the EOLEX mission, you uh, consider the EOLEX mission as being rather political as opposed to the rule of law mission. Unfortunately, in Kosovo, we have a very bitter experience regarding the political differences and political convictions even before the war. If you call it uh, as such, my question is, why in 2016 you applied to be elected or selected ahead of the special specialist chamber in The Hague? If the ULEX mission, you, if you consider the ULEX mission as being political, then the special uh, specialty uh, 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 chambers uh, would be uh, also political. Why did you apply to be president of the specialist chamber? I have an, a follow-up question. Are you a judge by profession? Did you ever work as a judge in your life before, before coming to Kosovo? And after you ended your mandate in Kosovo, did you ever work as a judge thereafter? And last, lastly, Mr. Zim, I mentioned about political uh, killings and murders of the, of the activists, LDK activists, but we did not get any specific answer on that because you were president of the Assembly of Elect Judges. Did you ever raise a concern to say that we need to focus on this topic, we need to target this uh, topic because this topic is of high importance for uh, the citizens of Kosovo. Thank you very much. Over to you, Mr. S Simons. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I mean, the question: Why now? Why am I? Uh, why am I sort of speaking to you now? Well, um, I mean, again, the answer is quite simple. I mean, you know, I have been raising concerns about corruption and misconduct since 2013. Um, all and this, all of my complaints are documented. So information that I have received from other judges, they're documented. Those complaints um, were all sent to ULEX um, head of missions office or head of executive division. In none of those matters was there ever an investigation um, into the allegations, not a single investigation. Um, so, uh, you know, as I've previously said, it, it's, it's not correct to say, well, I've just suddenly decided that I want to sort of come out and um, have a cleansing of my soul. Um, you know, I've been doing this, um, well, for, for the last sort of eight years. Um, and none of my concerns have been addressed, whether it's by ULEX, by the EU, or by the UK embassy. Um, in terms of the investigations that were commenced against me, I would be happy as part of your inquiry to provide you with copies of all of the disciplinary um, proceedings. Um, but, you know, I, I'll just give you a flavor of what was alleged against me. So for example, it was alleged that I had um, interfered in the transfer of a high profile um, prisoner um, from the high security prison in Podievo um, to the, um, you know, to another prison. Um, first of all, I didn't make that decision. It was made by the acting president of the court. Um, but I was found responsible by the disciplinary board for making a decision that I had not made. Um, in another case, um, the disciplinary board found me responsible for transferring a file from ULEX to the local judiciary. I didn't make that decision. The decision is signed by another judge. 
but the board found me responsible for that decision. Um, on another matter, the disciplinary board found me responsible because they said that I hadn't followed the correct whistleblower procedure. So they actually took disciplinary proceedings against me as a whistleblower because I hadn't followed the correct whistleblower procedure. I mean, the whole thing was so utterly absurd. Um, but you see, when you control process and outcome, so if you're prosecutor and judge, you're gonna get a conviction. And that is what was happening with the EU. And that is the reason I did not want the EU to investigate my allegations, the matters that I'm talking to you about today, um, because they will control process and outcome. Um, you asked me why did I apply to the um, specialist chambers? Well, for exactly the same reason that I applied to become a judge um, in ULEX, because, you know, I work in a decent, fair and honest way. Um, and I can't control the people around me. Um, you know, I hope that my colleagues are also decent, honest and fair um, and will administer justice. Um, and I suppose, you know, naively, um, I thought that I could change things. You know, I thought that I could come into ULEX and I thought that I would change the world. I thought that by the time I left Kosovo, Kosovo would be a better place. Um, but as one person, you know, you can't perform miracles. Um, and what has become clear in the Kosovo Specialist Chambers is that, first of all, it's an ethnic court. Um, and it's a court that is not interested in achieving justice. It's become clear that it is a court where process and outcome is controlled. You asked me if I've been a judge. Um, prior to my appointment in Bosnia, um, I was not a judge. I was a, a lawyer in London working for several um, large law firms. Um, I also served as a, as a coroner. And in the UK, a coroner, a coroner is unlike in the, in the US where a coroner is a medical examiner. In the UK, um, a coroner is considered uh, to be, um, by the Ministry of Justice, um, a quasi-judicial appointment. Um, and so when I went, when I joined, um, when I joined the mission in Bosnia, so I was a judge of the state court in Bosnia for four years uh, before coming to, um, to Kosovo, um, and I worked on serious organized crime cases um, and latterly, I was appointed to the special panel for war crimes. Um, so that was my pedigree. Um, those were my qualifications. And when I arrived in, um, or when I applied for the ULEX mission, I was interviewed by the then president of assembly of ULEX judges and two international judges. They knew what qualifications I had. They knew that I had um, been a coroner in England. They knew that I'd been a lawyer in England. They knew that I had served at the state court in Sarajevo for four years. Um, and they chose to select me. So, I mean, to, you know, it's difficult to sort of criticize me for a decision that was made by ULEX. Um, but I know that this has been mentioned before. Oh, you know, he was never a judge um, in England. I mean, my, my response is almost sort of, so what? Um, I think if you talk to, um, if you talk to um, lawyers in, in Kosovo, um, and, and I, would, I would invite you to do that and ask them, did they think that I was a decent judge? You know, did they think that I performed my function fairly and impartially? Um, and, I, and I'm reasonably confident that um, you will not find any lawyers who say he was useless, he didn't know what he was doing, he should never have been appointed. I think that um, most lawyers who I worked or who appeared before me um, would, would recognize my, my skills. I mean, what I should also say, insofar as the, the ULEX mission is concerned, you know, one of the requirements that was set by the 
EU was that you had to be a full-time judge for five years or more. So what we had is we had a situation where you, we had judges from, for example, Romania and Bulgaria who had been working in traffic court for five or six years who were perfectly qualified under EU rules for appointment to ULEX, but had no relevant experience. So you had judges from minor courts dealing with serious war crimes and serious organized crime. And yet, you know, the EU now criticizes me because they say, oh, well, you know, he was never a judge in England. Well, how about the fact that I served for four years at the state court in Sarajevo dealing with serious organized crime? Apparently that doesn't, that doesn't count um, for anything. But anyway, look, Mr. Salman, I don't, I don't want to take up any more of your time, but I, I hope that I've, I've answered um, your, your questions. Thank you very much, Madam Kitsa has asked for the floor and then Mr. Nola. Greetings to all. Thank you, Mr. Simmons, for all of your statements. And this raises a significant concern about the justice in Kosovo. However, my question is related to something else. You mentioned that there was cooperation, however, between Eulex prosecutors and the Serbian prosecutors. Now, my question on this issue would be, have are the cooperation rules international cooperation rules been applied in these transactions between Eulex prosecutors and belgrade prosecutors thank you madame kita the floor to you mr simmons thank you um the simple answer is i don't know because i was never party to those discussions um all I know is that um, files were given to Serbian prosecutors, um, and I know that international prosecutors met with Serbian prosecutors in Belgrade. Um, and I know that the files were handed over because that has been confirmed to me by the Serbian prosecution authorities um, in 2018. Um, I would invite you at some stage, I, I hope as part of, of a full inquiry, um, to speak to Maria Bamiet, because she was working in the prosecutor's office um, at the time um, those files were handed over. Um, and so she might have more and better information for you. <clears throat> but, you know, I just, just very briefly want to just come back to this issue about Serbian defendants. Um, because, you know, there has been this focus in ULEX on bringing former KLA commanders to justice. But we haven't had equal focus on bringing Serbian defendants to justice. And this is something that the international community must address. I have my suspicions as to why it has not been addressed. Um, but, you know, it's something that they clearly need to do because I, I, if I were a Kosovo Albanian citizen now sitting in Paya or in, in prison, I would be thinking, well, hold on, why is it only Kosovo Albanians who seem to be prosecuted? You know, when you look at the atrocities and the crimes that were committed in Kosovo, where are the Serbian defendants? You know, why are they not in trial? And I'm afraid it's just not good enough for the international community to say, oh, well, look, they're in, they're in Serbia and we don't have an international you know, extradition agreement with Serbia. I mean, that's a nonsense. Um, and more needs to be done to do justice for the victims um, who are living in, in Kosovo. Sorry, that was a very long answer to your question. Thank you very much for your response. 
naturally I will have to look for response to this question in other places as well because uh, we have not seen a proactive cooperation of the Ministry of Justice in this area and international legal cooperation cannot in any way or form happen without the involvement of the MOJ. So maybe we should make this question first internally and then externally. Thank you very much. We will continue with the question of the MP, Mr. Noura. Thank you, Chairman of the Commission, honored members, honored Mr. Simons. I'm Fadil Noura, an MP from the political party PDK in Kosovo, a lawyer by craft, and have knowledge of the Anglo Saxon and continental justice system. So that's why I have believed and continue to believe on the principles of this system beyond the topic that we are discussing today. So allow me please now to elaborate on this. This is because I was myself witness to the, I was a witness of an abusive process in the Drenica case, whereby the so-called protected witness during examination by the prosecutor with regard to his previous statement broke into crying, uh, break the protecting barricades and openly came before the trial body accusing the prosecutor saying that the statement is completely different. He does not accuse anyone and started speaking of the event because he said that Salustro, the prosecutor, has offered him to treat his wife abroad because his wife was sick and that's why his testimony was changed and he said that this is not something that he had previously stated always in tears at that moment the presiding judge Selitsky declared the witness as hostile witness that was shocking to me because I had read a lot and fully trust the principles of the European Union justice. But seeing a such mission in applying the inquisitory form exact examination in the 21st century was shocking. So Mr. Simons, in addition to what you declared, I believe it to be rather easy to argue that the OLEX mission on behalf of justice has created more victims than justice. By doing this, we would be helping the EU itself who would have to investigate this full transparency and bring the people in charge and those who are responsible before justice and compensate the victims. So we should not try to withhold the legit, the image by putting these red tapes. The image cannot be protected when there is facts and arguments proving that human rights as have been violated and these human rights are the cornerstones of the European Union. Mm. I, Mr. Simon, in addition to the people in charge of this process, your report and your witness will be in the service of the truth. And I strongly believe that if not today, certainly tomorrow or in a close future the new leadership the new european generation will not allow the european union to be smudged in such way so mr simons i have two or in fact three questions first and foremost considering that today in the specialized chambers of the prosecution office in Hawk, where we have judges such as uh, Dariu Siliski and uh, other prosecutors, which you know very well. Do you think that this institution, in fact, has credibility? to serve justice in the country? That's the first question. Second question, Mr. Simmons, during your mandate, as you are probably aware, the second US American prosecutor, Mr. David Schriederman, left the mission without concluding his mandate following a statement 
that the public opinion is aware of with regard to the investigation process conducted by him. In your opinion, why has this happened? The removal of prosecutor David Schriderman. Mm. Also, another question that I would like to ask is that you mentioned several times, and I would like to know more because you said that it's not only the Drenica and the Klechka case, and you were also referring to the case of Oliver Ivanovich. So here I would like to know more or less about the corruptive process of that time by Salustro and Judge Francesco Flore with regard to the Lopi group. But particularly, I'm very interested to know, in the midst of all these abusation, and you said there are other cases, was there any abuse of the rights against the war invalid, Mr. Sabit Gezi? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nora. The floor for you, Mr. Simmons. Okay, thank you, Mr. Nora. Um, in terms of credibility of the Kosovo Specialist Chambers, um, you know, I'm sure that there are some judges there who are decent and honorable and in whom you can have confidence. Um, what I have seen so far uh, regarding the process, um, it seems quite clear to me that justice will not be done. Um, this is a very one-sided process. Um, I, I don't really wanna say very much more at the moment. I think that it would be useful for the committee to actually hear from, perhaps from some of the lawyers who are appearing before um, that court. Um, because I have heard stories that, um, of things that go on that should not go on before any court um, in the world, let alone such a high profile court. Um, I think that there should be an inquiry into exactly what is happening um, in the Kosovo Specialist Chambers. Personally, I would not want to be a defendant um, before that court because I would, um, I, I do not believe that I would get justice. Um, in terms of which Mr. Schwendemann, um, I had heard that, um, I'd heard rumors that um, he would be removed um, because indictments hadn't been filed. I also heard rumors, and these are rumors, um, that um, the cases that were proceeding before the court were quite weak, or sorry, the cases that were in the investigation stage um, were quite weak. I don't know. I haven't seen those files. I haven't seen the evidence. Um, all I can tell you is the, the rumors that I heard. Um, you know, I heard the rumors that um, Schwendemann was going to be removed and he was going to be replaced with someone who could be, and the word used was trusted. Um, and, and, you know, and I've heard that other prosecutors have left um, because they had concerns about the um, about the way that court operates, and I think that that should be explored further um, by the relevant authorities in um, in Kosovo. Um, but it's also interesting that there are no Kosovo judges sitting on that court. Um, you know, staff um, are carefully selected so that there is no one with any connection to Kosovo, as far as I'm aware, has been selected. Um, and you know, that is something that I'm hearing um, from a number of people who have applied um, and who have not been, um, have not been interviewed. Their, their applications have simply been returned. Um, but I do not understand how a court serving justice in Kosovo um, has no Kosovo judges on it um, and is sitting over in the um, sitting over in the Hague. Um, in terms of um, war crime cases, um, I don't really want to comment on Drenica for two reasons. First, because I think that those proceedings are ongoing, but secondly, because I was not particularly familiar with the evidence in those cases. Um, what I can comment on is is um, Kletchka. 
Um, and what I can tell you is that I had very serious concerns about the way that case was prosecuted. Um, I had concerns about um, the way the evidence was presented. Um, and it seemed to me that um, there were attempts to, um, to obstruct justice. Let me put it that way. Um, in terms of um, Mr. Florit, um, that is one of the investigations that I refer to in my evidence. And I think that others will want to give evidence about that investigation as part of a full um, inquiry. Um, I don't really want to say very much more than that. Um, Getsy, um, again, I am aware of the, the case of Getsy, and um, this is Sabic Getsy. And um, again, as part of a, um, a full inquiry, I would be happy to sort of hand over um, documentation. Um, there were, I had concerns about a number of cases um, where there were attempts to sort of interfere um, in the way those cases were being um, being handled. Um, and, and so far as the protected witness is concerned, your example of the Drenitzer case does not surprise me um, because I have been involved in other cases where um, I have been made aware that protected witnesses um, had arrived in court and were um, stating that um, they had been presented with a statement um, that had been changed. It wasn't quite the statement that they had made. Um, and I think in some cases they'd even signed translations of statements that they weren't even able to, um, they weren't even able to, to understand. Um, so I think that all needs to be looked at as part of a, a wider inquiry. I hope Mr. Nora that answers your, your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Simmons. Is there any other MPs that would like to make questions? Yes, Mr. Dugole. No. Thank you, Mr. Simmons. Thank you, Chairman, honored MPs. I'm not a member of this commission, but being that I am one of the signatories of the request for a public hearing by Mr. Simmons, and since this refers to issues of justice and lack of justice for the Albanian people in such a long time is a wound that keeps, keeps the Kosovo society unable to heal. Here, I would like to speak a specific question. Your testimony, Mr. Simmons, is public and for a significantly long time has been addressed and debated in the Kosovo society and quite rightfully as the previous speakers said this testimony in one way has among other things created confusion because knowing that you were one of the presidents or head of the OLEX institutions and given some of the statements made by other former judges or employers of OLEX, one comes to the conclusion that there is something wrong, but the, 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 the ambiguity, the confusion is further enhanced because when there are statements or testimonies like you or uh, Madame Maria Bamia, only after they have completed their missions or after leaving, mm. it's difficult not just to be more convincing and to be more acceptable for the cost of a society. I would like to make a question because as you know, justice first and foremost requires a form of sacrifice, professional and moral. Being aware of all of these violations, why did you not go public before you completed the mission or before a disciplinary procedure being Mm. initiated against you because now we find ourselves facing the question and the doubt that everything is coming out only 
after people leave the mission, once they are part of the missions, they don't say anything. There is an informative blackout when they are part of the mission. But once the mission is completed, something completely different comes up. Now, with regard to the approach of the ULEX mission uh, toward the prosecution of war crimes, it is more than evident what you just said, that there was a lack of seriousness in terms of prosecuting war crimes involving Serbian uh, defenders. However, I think that this should have been said and written down while you were the head of the mission. Thank you very much, Mr. Dugole. Thank you. We are at the end of the meeting. After you, Mr. Hussaini has asked the floor. First, we hear from Mr. Simmons. Yes, Mr. Simmons, you have the floor. Okay. Um, it's a perfectly reasonable question. Why didn't I say anything before I left the mission? Um, the, the fact is that I did. Um, and if you go back to 2013 in July, um, I raised this with the UK embassy. I raised serious concerns about interference in criminal trials. Um, at that time, I was, um, and I, again, I've got to be very careful about what I say, but I was told that I would be seen as a troublemaker if I continued to press um, these issues. Um, so, um, and for that reason, I didn't um, go public. Um, and, you know, my, the way that I approached this was to fight for change from within rather than going outside of the mission. Because I suppose, you know, as a judge, I, I tried to be professional. Um, I tried to... Um, to deal with things through a chain of command, through following the proper procedures. Um, and so, you know, I raised all of my concerns in the way that I was expected to raise them and through the people um, through whom I was expected to raise these concerns. And that was what was expected of me. And that is what I did. Um, and in fact, you know, in fairness, I, I didn't choose now to, to go public. Um, you know, I was forced to go public because I was exposed as a whistleblower. And so, you know, throughout that time, I was sort of pushing for change. I was raising concerns. I was trying to improve things. Um, and it was only when um, my emails were um, disclosed and disciplinary action was taken against me um, that, you know, I had no option but to, you know, go public. Um, I hadn't chosen that course of action. I'd always chosen to do things through the, um, through the correct channels. Um, and, you know, um, I think it was Mr. Salman, I sort of raised the point about the, um, you know, the disciplinary proceedings. And I, and I would like you as part of a full inquiry to see the disciplinary proceedings, because you will see what it was alleged that I did that was so serious that it justified me being removed from the, um, from the mission. So that's important. Um, in terms of Serbian war criminals, well, I mean, the fact is that I and other judges had consistently raised this um, with mission management um, for a number of years, because we were very concerned um, that the court in The Hague would be perceived as an ethnic court. Um, and on various occasions, I met with the chief ULEX prosecutor um, and asked why we weren't seeing more Serbian defendants appearing before ULEX judges in Kosovo. And of course, one of the explanations I was given was, well, because most of the Serbian defendants are currently in Serbia and we cannot get our hands on them. Um, and of course, this then brings me round to the, to the point that I've made previously, which is, well, why couldn't we get our hands on these people? 
Um, and that quite simply enough was not being done to bring those persons to justice. You know, those defendants are still sitting in Belgrade in coffee shops as we speak, um, completely free. They've evaded justice and nothing is being done um, to bring them to, to justice. Um, so, um, yes, in answer to your second point, it, it was an ongoing theme about the fact that we had so few Serbian defendants appearing before Kosovo courts. Um, and also we were concerned about um, the fact that um, it was not envisaged that any Serbian defendants would appear before um, the Kosovo specialist chambers. And I mean, and, and that's, the, that's the reality and will be the reality um, for some time, I'm afraid. Thank you, Mr. Hidayat Iseni has the floor now. Mr. Iseni, please. Thank you, Chairman. I would initially like to extend my greetings to Mr. Simons and thank him and commend him and con for his professional interest and courage, but most of all for his human side. Uh, it is better that you are the ones who has expressed the, your willingness to contribute to justice. So it's good it, that it is not us who has invited you. Uh, the forefathers of justice have said that the gravest violation of justice are the ones that are conducted by the means of law. Mm -hmm. For reasons that are known, we are grateful for the international presence and we remain grateful for international presence in our country. And we are grateful to the peacekeeping missions, to the missions that have helped us in the normalization and the democratization process, including you lax. However, it would be unsincere, unsincere of us to say that in addition to the guts and to the goods and the contribution, there are also difficulties, problems, and bad experiences, so to say. And for that, we have to be free to speak them out loud. You mentioned one of the gravest anomalies the fact that there is an asymmetrical approach to Serbia, who was the main perpetrator of everything bad in the Balkans, compared to Kosovo, who was the victim of a genocidal war. But this is not the only thing. Belgrade, as is notoriously known, has passed this challenge by doing some light dribbling. They created a special chamber in the court of the city of Belgrade with a dozen of defendants who were quickly acquitted, acquitted and then mm. the ball was in our court in relation to our friends so that we had to look forward to to the future, toward reconciliation, toward European integration. It was something that was novel and positive, but then it resulted to be abusive as well. So your reiteration, your emphasis on this misfortune obliges us to thank you. However, I would like to mention one fact that has not been sufficiently clarified This anomaly was actually contributed to by us as well because we tied our own hands, given that it entailed a great misconception because this is not something that only had to be addressed from the humanity part, but also from the law legal part. Having great trust in the international com community, we actually 
adopted an approach of forgetting the past and not looking for our rights, which then consequently resulted with a law and with an agreement that contained, in lack of other words, significant deficiencies. So these problems make all of these agreements and law questionable. So this is where I want to emphasize. It was not the willingness of all MPs or even the willingness of the majority of the MPs to establish the specialized chamber as they were called, but which a, in fact designed to work as a special court. This was accepted as a necessary evil. The impetus that was given to us because they said that if you pass this task, which was said to us before with the demarcation, everything else, so they said, if you pass this, you will have these liberalization and you should swallow this and then have abundant other goods. But that occurred and that happened to be a mistake because there were violations throughout the process by the fact that the legal potential of CASA was completely excluded from the court. And what you said and addressed today, rightfully so, in fact, did happen. There were remarks and even initiatives to review and to probably address this. I here would like to add the emphasis, and it might be beyond the topic of discussion today, but I think is important for us and for the entire picture. A law that was created by different stimulus and threats saying that if you do not, accept this law, international community would leave Kosovo, independence would be threatened, peace would be threatened, even to the extent of other frauds and misuses. Everything that was used to ensure this is in violation of international treaties. And it even contradicts our own domestic laws. However, the Vienna Convention on International Treaties in cases when there are errors, and in our case, there was numerous errors, when there is misleadings, and in our case, there were a lot of misleadings which continue to be there, when there is corruption, uh, dare I say, a sophisticated corruption because an entire population has been corrupted by the threats and the stimulus that were given to us. We were forced as people, as an assembly to do this. So the assemblies hold the rights to disputes or even invalidate such agreements. Kosovo has not requested to do this. We were always in favor of continuing cooperation. However, the right to review and correct any anomalies that have in a systematic way damaged the entire normalization process and the rule of law in Kosovo, I think, in my opinion, would be understood by the international presence and our friends. Thank you, Mr. Rishene. That was my question. So how, what do you think, Mr. Simmons, about this great defect and the possibility that in cooperation with the constructive part, with the peace-loving part from among the international community in Kosovo to through cooperation with a democratic procedure to undergo a process of eliminating causes and then eliminate consequences. Sesam causa, sesam impetus. Thank you, Mr. Yushini. The floor to you, Mr. Simmons. Um, yes, I'm, I'll be perfectly frank. I, I, I'm not entirely sure what, how you would like me to address this point because it's quite a, it's quite a detailed point that I think is probably one more for the politicians than, um, 
than the judges. Um, I mean, I, I know that there are serious concerns about the Kosovo specialist chambers. Um, and, and, and I think that there are some fundamental issues that have to be addressed. And, and it's, it's, I'm, I'm not sure that I can, um, I mean, this is a matter, say, for the Kosovo government and for the people of Kosovo. Um, but what I find disturbing is the fact that um, Kosovo was effectively bullied into accepting this court. Um, this court does serve a purpose for some political parties. Um, there's no question of that. But this is a court sitting in The Hague, full of international judges. There are no local judges. It is a Kosovo court. Um, and it, to my mind, um, it should at the very least be based in Kosovo. And if it's not based in Kosovo, arguably it should no longer exist. But I think the thing that causes me most concern about the specialist chambers is the fact that it is set up to try um, Albanians. That is it. Um, and, and I think that the, the government of Kosovo has to carefully review this um, with the international community. Um, you know, I mean, if you have a fair justice system, nobody should be afraid of that because if you're innocent, you go through the justice system and you will be acquitted at the end. But where the justice system is um, manipulated and contrived, um, it serves to undermine justice and rule of law. And, and I totally understand the concerns of some um, that the chambers um, is undermining justice and rule of law for the people of Kosovo. Um, and I think there has to be a fundamental review. Now, there will be a lot of kickback from the international community on this because this is um, one of their centerpieces. Um, the, the Kosovo Specialist Chambers is something that um, the international community has fought long and hard to achieve. But even the, you know, the international community has to recognize that this court does not have the support of a very significant um, proportion of the people of Kosovo. Um, and therefore, to what extent does it remain legitimate? But those aren't really matters for me. I mean, that's really for the, for the politicians and for the, um, and for the diplomats. Um, but, you know, I personally, do not have confidence in that court um, because of the way it is structured, uh, because of its composition, um, and because of the fact that all of the defendants are Kosovo Albanians. Um, you know, and the international community has not done enough um, to bring Serbian defendants to justice. Uh Anyone else before we close this conference? In that case, that being said, I'd like to thank Mr. Simons for his presentation and willingness to answer to the questions of the MPs. Thanks to the members of the Committee on Legislation for their inputs, as well as the other participating MPs. So that being said, we're gonna adjourn this meeting. I, I, I suppose it was uh, very important for the public as well as for the uh, MPs to hear the points of view of Mr. Simons concerning um, the functioning of uh, EU LAX in Kosovo. So that being said, I have nothing else to add. Uh, Mr. Simons, uh, any uh, closing remarks from, from your side? If not, I consider this closed. No, but thank you very much indeed for, for listening to me this morning. I'm sorry I've been sort of slightly long-winded at times. Um, and, and I just want to reiterate that I think this is such an important issue for a full inquiry. And, and I'm confident that others will come forward 
um, both international and local who will want to um, to assist you. But thank you very much indeed for taking the time um, this morning to to um, speak with me. So thanks once again, uh, respected MPs. So that being said, this uh, joint meeting is adjourned and see you in the, in the future meetings on the committees for legislation. Mr. Simons, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you.